Welcome to Outshore Radio. Many people would just look at my unassuming identity on the internet and think to themselves, well, this guy knows a bit about UFOs and might have seen an alien once or something like that. Saw some lights in the sky overhead and maybe he's got some theories about UFOs he's read from everybody else's stuff. Well, that's actually not where I'm from. I've had over... 30 years exposure to this stuff at least from early childhood anyway but from what I can remember starting about say 1980 that's a few years ago now uh, the first interactions with these stuff, things you'd call the greys which is demonic of course as you discover this in time that they're demonic but a lot of people would say well you know okay, we've had bedroom experiences have been explained and accounted for many times in the Whitley Stryber books and Professor Mack, bit classic bedroom encounters uh, Professor Mack was a very brave pilgrim who had a rather strange death in London actually he seemed to be on the cusp of giving us some very important information and he was just taken away by somebody under the control of drink or the demon drink or just maybe his demons, I have no idea but end of the day we lost Professor Mack, who had turned these vague phenomenon into real medical, psychological, and ultimately physical realities for us. We lost a great champion. But before Professor Mack was writing his stuff, I was encountering this kind of thing. So I was very pleased to see Professor Mack collated all these witness accounts. Because Bud Hopkins and uh, ultimately Whitley Stryber as well they got all that material together for us and now it tends to be overlooked oh we're just overreacting but they're really just our star brothers and they've got all sorts of wonderful things in store for us now I used to listen to these people though these see these people you'll hear today that are star brothers from different stars from the Arturians the royal lyre and Plady council of come to announce the following da de da de da inverted commas be good the Royal Council of Pleiades has told us to be good otherwise they'll never do anything for us if we're not good and if we're not good enough they'll never do anything for us and of course it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because they never do anything for us so we can't be any good then can we etc etc so how have I survived into the 21st century I've taken a look at my past and recognise that it's been interacted with. And some people say, well, yeah, there's plenty of fairy encounters in people's lives. The fairies, the alternate reality, the men in black, the manifestation of our fears, knocking on our door, stuff like that. The men in black turn up, blah, blah, blah. It's malevolent authority figures manifest in one way or another. I was listening to all these people that were saying, well, give them a chance. There are star brothers. Maybe they've got some something good for us because they're really nice people. I was off that state of mind as well, of giving them a chance, and I gave them a chance. And my goodness, did they! They took that chance when they got a hold of me. They took that chance. There were manifestations in my flat. In Leith, tall, stick-like hybrid being, pretending to be from some regal interstellar court or high court you know princess or something you know this kind of thing and then I was introduced to what I would come to call the three day alien interface that I was a, a good little boy sort of thing but that interstellar mama my interstellar surrogate family really from the place wherever they were from anyway I my interstellar surrogate family had a wee project for me, a wee schoolboy home homework project for me, because I was I was even though I was in my in my forties and all that, I was still a a boy relatively speaking to these ancient and venerable, highly advanced etc etc. And I'm you know the new age movement is echoing in my mind. Give them a chance. Give them a chance. Okay, so we gave them a chance. I gave them a chance. What did I do? Well, they introduced me to what was called the three-day alien interface. And the chance was for me to take a look at human culture, 
that's all human culture, but particularly, you know, regional culture, national culture, like Scottish culture, English culture, Spanish, German, American, Australian, Swiss, Norwegian. There's a whole lot of different cultures we could look at. And from these cultures, could I find ways of removing, filtering out the the blood and the gore and the and the horror and the sickness and the death and disease and keep the good stuff. That was my project. I create this new interstellar reality for the human race. And I'm thinking, well, how could I possibly do that? I'm thinking, I'm thinking to myself, how could I possibly do that? And the thoughts come back, you know. Ah, but we're going to hook you up with something extra special. A mind-machine interface. I thought it was a bit weird. But anyway, it's just ultimately just more of telepathic nonsense. But at the end of the day, though, I, for three days and three nights, 72 hours, round the clock, entered in to a creative... I mean very creative frenzy I looked at every single cultural product from these various countries it was like having an encyclopedia go through my mind at the time I would design realities based on the culture I could salvage I would come up with the architecture the buildings and there would be textures be like switching through all sorts of colour swatches and it's like anything in a software. I was looking at textures for stone, colours and marbling for stones. I was going through the entire lot. Sample selections of soft furnishings for the interiors of some of these places. And I was coming up with, um, well, here's a good example. This is one I can definitely remember the most. And to be honest, it, it just shows you exactly how great a temptation this is for the human race. One of my projects was Caledonian Interstellar, that's Scotland Interstellar. What gift could Scotland give the universe that is eternal, bloodless, and could be a great point of interaction between many species? It would be a great bringing together of many different races, many different beings. One sport Scotland uses, it's not a contact sport, but there's one sport that Scotland invented, that Scotland uniquely invented, that could do just that, with a little bit of interstellar shenanigans. And I call this, wait for it, interstellar handicap golf. The game of golf. Now imagine if you had a, a being that was 20 foot tall with a big golf club. And a being that was 2 foot tall with a wee golf club. And they had a, a golf ball. Say a human sized golf ball. Or a, a golf ball more in keeping with the club that they've got. But supposing therefore the 20 foot tall being uses his club and hits his golf ball for a drive down the fairway. Now, a 20 foot tall being hitting a golf ball of any size down a fairway is going to produce one mighty sized over... But supposing these golf balls that are supplied for this particular game of golf are little handicapping systems or anti-gravity robot sort of things they're like anti hover hovering anti-gravity technology now supposing the maximum drive that a two foot being could hit and a 20 foot being could hit would be the same maximum drive distance that a six foot one human being could hit that somehow if the scaling system could be made relative that every two foot being could hit the equivalent distance of a six foot being and that every twenty foot being
could hit the equivalent distance of a six foot being, human being. And there you have interstellar handicap golf because you've got the, the way. There are some variants on that where within the actual handicapping system itself for each species, for the 20 foot species, the species of people that are 20 foot, it might be that they, um, they have some physiological differences. Some of them might like to party and are therefore are not as coordinated and therefore don't hit the ball as well in their 20 foot. They're not, they wouldn't be professionals. They wouldn't, they wouldn't enter that level of um, proficiency that would require more excellent ratings, more excellent accuracies and stuff like that. And it might be the same for, the, for the, the two feet beings might like to party as well. Someone might like to party more than the professionals, say. People with more professionally orientated uh, approach to their, to their body and their well-being. So, interstellar handicap golf, you'd have the, the actual anti-gravity ball would be zeroed or normalised on sea level gravity at the old course in St Andrews from the first hole. You can see how it's a very rational and realistic idea to have, can you imagine if you were working for an interstellar society and you had remit to design things like that and you knew that they had the technology to do it they just haven't thought of it yet but that you've got this opportunity to to really shine and be a, a now I, I was going on like that with things like that I think I did things like that for other sports as well and then I got into um, ornaments and monumental designs and clever use of Scottish culture, tartan and Scottish foodstuffs and that was just that side of it and then I got asked in subsequent years to design infrastructure I mean planetary infrastructure we're talking about, I mean big stuff we're talking about cities an encyclopedic display flickering through my mind, I would pick out on the different images I would look at the right sort of synthesis we were going to have for the planet and the, the kind of stuff. I mean, there I am. I'm totally engaged as a social engineer, social architect, in my head. A legend in my own lunchtime, every lunchtime, for a few days anyway. There's the ultimate temptation. You can see why people get dragged on by this stuff. Because it is very, very real. And it is very, very special. And it's only as special, I suppose, as the creative people that are putting this stuff into it. But I did not know, I hadn't a clue at the time, what sort of danger I was really in. Because I was opening out more and more. They were feasting on my, on my life essences, as far as I'm concerned. I was, I was just opening up more and more to this stuff. Caledonian interstellar handicap golf. What a guy! Listen, I invented an interstellar game that could, and then I, I designed these planets. They were like they weren't like Death Stars; they were like Life Stars, and these were planets that were full of wonderful things, from um, swimming pools, spas, hospitals, manufacturing realities, manufacturing bases. Ah, you know what a time! It was like I was doing the research for a science fiction novel. Ultimately, that's the best way to look at it. Now, I suppose I should have sat down and written the science fiction novel. But then again, I realised that the more and more I went into this, the more and more the stuff was feasting on my life force. Because ultimately, it was fulfilling my hopes, my expectations. It was never theirs. Because these beings are not interstellar beings. They're not part of a federation. They're not part of a, of a galactic empire. They're basically interdimensional ants, termites, roaming without any particular physical home. And they attach themselves to places, creative hubs full of kind of flowering geniuses, I suppose, and they milk them of their pollen, the way that bees and ants do. That's the end of story. 
Now this is what's going on. But people don't realise that. They think they're, they're, they're special because they've been chosen. When I started to catch on, because, by the way, this, let's get this in perspective. That, however many days that I was involved in that, that actually drained me out for at least a couple of years. I could do very little after that. There was a whole part of my life was drained, absolutely creatively wrung out, drained of absolutely every creative idea for years and years after that. And they came in again maybe ten years later for a bit more, but I was not often that so much by then, you see. But it took me a while to catch on. You guys, maybe because you're younger, you watch Star Trek, you think that there's a Federation of Alien Greys out there on a planet somewhere and Enterprise is going to go down the down the railroad track somewhere. It doesn't work like that. That eternity is interdimensional and there's, there's probably a planet only two inches from your nose and you don't really realise it. That's the truth. More likely to be very closest to our nose is this ant hive of alien fairies or greys or archons or jinn or demons or whatever you want to call them, insectoid, they're right there trying to milk us out. And that's something that you've got to come to terms with because if you don't, if you don't, you're going to find it very hard to see reality at the end of this life. 